things are not always done in offices and there's a real world out there and you have to experience that real world to try to connect dots, ask people questions, see what's going on in different accounts and in different types of accounts. Um, and then with that, put those different dots together to come up with your kind of idea of where you're going to go. Hello and welcome to Proud to Be You, the official alumni podcast of Boston University. I'm your host, Jeff Murphy. Thanks so much for tuning in. Our guest today is Robert Vale, a School of Hospitality Administration alum who serves as the head of innovation for the iconic Boston Beer Company. Robert spoke with me about his 30 plus year career at the organization and how he combines research, data, world exploration, and gut instinct to drive ideas forward. Proud to Be You showcases the journeys of some of Boston University's most interesting and accomplished alumni. Inspiring grads share the highs, the lows, and the challenges they've overcome along the way from calm out to innovative careers. No matter where your path takes you, Proud to be you. Robert, thank you so much for taking time to be on the Proud to Be You podcast. I have been looking forward to speaking with you for a long time. I am a big fan of your work and have many extra pounds of it hanging off of my frame. Uh, but would you mind getting us started by just telling me your role and your company? Hi, Jeff. Uh, it's so nice to be with you. Um, I am lucky enough to be the head of innovation at the Boston Beer Company. And how, if we were to meet at a dinner party, how would you explain what that means? Uh, I'm guessing a lot of people might have misconceptions about what your role is. Yeah, what the beauty of my role is, is I get to come up with new beverages and I get to go across the world to find new things that people are drinking, um, either alcoholic or non-alcoholic, um, or even sometimes even foods, and then take those and put them together to come up with a new alcoholic or non-alcoholic product. Like one of my newest ones is general admission coming out in March, which is a new non-alcoholic beer. Um, so I am uh, have the pleasure of taking the things that I'm, I think I'm pretty good at, putting them all together and coming up with beverages that, that hopefully people enjoy. You mentioned uh, traveling the world to, to get new ideas and you had told me about a recent trip you just came back from in Mexico. Would you mind sharing a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, one of our suppliers who gives us, um, works with us on all our flavors and helps us put together beverages, um, took us on a food, drink, and cultural trek throughout Mexico City. Um, it was a great trip for me because it's one place I have not been um, in the world. It, it is a great, great city. Um, over 22 million people in Mexico City and some of the finest food um, and beverages I've ever had, plus the people on top of it were just extraordinary, one that I was with, and two, the people that um, I met during the trip. Um, and the other part to me, since I had never been there before, it's one city that I was very surprised about, how beautiful the trees and the bushes in around the city are. These There's a absolutely gorgeous old, old trees um, that give it a, a unique feeling to almost any other city I've ever been in. Hmm. I'll have to add it to my list. Um, but specifically, as far as your work goes, was there something in particular you were you're checking out or looking at? Yeah, so I, I'm working on two or three different things. Um, I'm looking at a possibility of a tapache um, for us, and I'm also looking at a couple of other areas um, for us to develop. And I wanted to learn more about tapache because it came from the Mayans over a thousand years ago. Um, and it's somewhat pre uh, prevalent um, inside of Mexico City. It was interesting. It was more available at kind of the lower areas, lower class areas, and then on the higher class areas at some of the finest restaurants there were tapaches. But really in, in, in the middle of the economic uh, layout of Mexico City, we didn't see very much tapache, um, but it was great to learn about it. Um, and we got to have some amazing foods and spices and learn um, about the culture of how Spain was influenced, um, how Vienna lager actually, um, which most Mexican beers are, uh, are styled after, came from um, the influence of at the time when Austria was um, overseeing that part of the world. Hmm. That's all fascinating. There's this mix of history and 
uh, food and culture with the work you're doing. Well, let's rewind the clock a little bit. Uh, I'm curious to know uh, if you were a kid growing up, and I don't think you grew up in the Massachusetts area, right? Where are you originally from? Yeah, I, I was. I grew up in New York, in Long Island. And so how did you end up at BU? And obviously you came in the School of Hospitality Administration. Did you know you always wanted to be involved in food, beverages, et cetera? Well, um, my dad uh, got, was in a job that was uh, across the entire world. And I was lucky enough to travel with him a bunch across the world. And in those um, travels was able to see um, a lot of different cultures and then especially go out to some amazing dinners, lunches, and breakfasts. And it kind of took to where that I loved um, the interaction of one of how people were hospital to, hospitality was to me and what I thought was interesting about all these different foods and the cultures that came from them. Uh, and, and I'd love to try different things. And it still goes to this day that I will try almost anything that's put in front of me. Um, and so with that, it gave me the opportunity to think about if I'm going to do something, I want to kind of be directed towards that. And at the time, I have an older brother that was living in Boston. So between the my brother being here and my desire to be in food and beverage, um, I was the actually the first, I believe, the first graduating class of the v BU Hotel and Food School. Um, and, and it all worked out perfectly for me to be one inside of a city, which I loved going to a city school. Um, and then also being part of, of a new development of a new program at BU. So Shaw students today, an internship is so crucial to their experience, or several internships. Were you doing uh, similar kinds of work outside of the classroom, you know, real world, hands-on, outside of the classroom learning at, during your BU days? I did. Um, I probably had one of the best jobs, uh, both financially and uh, for my friends and myself while I was at BU. Um, I was a doorman at Cheers, at the height of Cheers. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, with that, you know, most people, there was a long line on Thursday nights because everybody wanted to watch Cheers at Cheers. Um, so we would have two or 300 people sometime in line waiting to get in. Um, and it was great to ex ex experience all the different people from around the world that wanted to be part of it. Um, most of them were upset because it doesn't look much like the set does when they see it on TV. Um, but they were excited to be inside uh, and watch the show um, at Cheers. So I did that for two years and there was some also some nice financial rewards with that job. Did that get you connected to the uh, beer industry? I, I realized in looking at your bio, it seems like there might have been about six years or so after you graduated before you went to Boston Beer Company? What was happening during that time? Yeah, so um, one of the other jobs I had during that time period, during the summertime, is I worked um, at a restaurant up in New Hampshire called the Woodshed Restaurant. Um, it was in Moultonboro, New Hampshire. Unfortunately, it burnt down, but a good friend of mine rebuilt it back up again, and it's up and running again. Uh, and the person that owned that uh, wanted to open a bunch of restaurants and I went to work for him the day after I graduated from BU, went to Wolfboro, New Hampshire, and opened a restaurant called Aw Shucks. Um, and then afterwards, I moved to Portland, Maine, opened up another Aw Shucks there, moved to Greenwich, Connecticut, opened up another one there, and then actually opened, um, just before I left um, that company, one opened right across from Boston Garden. It was... 1991, I think that you started at Boston Beer Company. How did you get connected with them? And, and I mean, it, that must have been a fascinating experience looking back on it now. You were one of the first employees at that company, right? Yes. Um, it's kind of interesting. I was um, thinking about going back into the restaurant that I was, the company I was at kind of folded and there was a bunch of things that occurred. Um, and I was thinking about going back into a rush, back into the restaurant business again. And I was offered um, a very good job and I was driving down Mar Marlboro Street in Boston and the person who ran the old company I was with, I hadn't seen him for a while and there he was walking down the street and I kind of saw it as something, ooh, maybe this is a, a sign I shouldn't go back into the restaurant business. So I decided not to take that job and to look for something else and see if I could find something that was attached to the wor world of food and beverage, but not have to work weekends um, and other things that occur during being part of a restaurant. 
And uh, lo and behold, one of my good friends um, heard that Jim Cook um, was looking for some people to work at Boston Beer Company at Sam Adams at the time. That's all we were with Sam Adams. And um, I was able to meet with Jim and Rhonda, um, who was the two original partners, uh, for an interview in Boston. And it was a last minute interview. And I did not do quite, to be honest, I didn't do a great job um, really investigating the company, but they did like me enough that I was hired. Um, and, and ever since, it's been a, a wonderful relationship for me to be at Boston Beer Company. I think I read that you started out sort of on the sales team and you've just been there now for for 32 years, 33 years? 34 years. 34. Uh, yeah, this Congratulations. is my 34th year at Boston Beer. And I was in sales. Um, it, originally, there really, we were only a sales company because at the time we were, we didn't own any breweries because Jim wanted to take the time and effort to build a brand and a company um, because he knew that he could find great um, co-packers to make his beer uh, for him. And he actually has a, a kind of a really wonderful story about that, that people went against his idea of doing co-packing, but it's, it's very natural in manufacturing to use co-packers to do your product. And he has a great analogy uh, when people kind of said, well, it's not your brewery, so it's not really your beer. And he said, well, let me ask you this. If um, Julia Child came over to your house and used your kitchen, used your stove, used your pots and pans, but she came with all her techniques, her skills, and her recipe, and then served a dinner, whose dinner would that be? Would that be your dinner or would that be Julia Child's dinner? And that's what Jim did is he took his great-great-grandfather's recipe um, and use the ingredients of using um, the highest quality malt, um, hops that came from Germany, and also the way that his grandfather did it was a unique technique uh, that other brewers weren't doing, but they did have the facilities to do what he wanted to do. So um, it was a, a great way to build a company through sales um, on the streets, day in and day out to people to get it. And then eventually we were able to uh, buy our own breweries. This episode is brought to you by BU Connects, Boston University's exclusive online platform for alumni and student networking, mentoring, and more. Explore the profiles of nearly 30,000 Terriers and see how they're willing to help. Join groups to network with members who share your city, industry, or interests. Share advice or mentorship with students in need. Promote your business in the alumni business directory or find jobs posted by and for the BU community. Activate your free profile today at buconnects.com. I got to imagine, I mean, Jim Cook is a literally a business icon here in New England, not just Boston. And in working with him alongside him in various capacities for the last 34 years, if you look at that time sort of in total, what are, what are the big lessons that you've learned from him or uh, things that he's helped you to understand about the inter industry and innovation in that time. Um, it's funny. So still to this day, I, uh, he and I are working on something and we hit the streets of Boston two weeks ago. Um, and, and I think that's probably one of the best ways to describe who he is and what he's about is things are not always done in offices and there's a real world out there and you have to experience that real world to try to connect dots, ask people questions, see what's going on in different accounts and in different types of accounts. Um, and then with that, put those different dots together to come up with your kind of idea of where you're going to go. And probably the, the best things, two best things I can describe about Jim inside of this is his simplicity to be able to describe things. Um, and one of them is, uh, which I actually used that day while I was with him, that I learned from him, I think it was probably like five weeks into the job, we had a meeting and he brought this one line out, um, which is he, to have a, a product, there's really only two things about your product. Your product is either better than your competition or your product is cheaper than your competition. And otherwise it might be a fad that just kind of comes and goes. But think in that simplicity, can I make something that's better than anyone? And that's 
almost everything we've always done has always been better and um, or you could be cheaper. Um, and we've always tended to go with the better side of things. The other one was, was a, a really good analogy when I moved to Chicago and I moved to running our distributorships there and uh, we were with a new wine wholesaler, most of the time with beer wholesalers in the United States who are dirt distribute things to liquor liquor accounts and to restaurants and bars. And th they were just not going up and down the streets very well and didn't understand liquors and bar uh, bars, especially more kind of beer bars. Um, and I told them that, was, you know, th they're just not in the market. And he said to me, well, what's a market? You know, you can't really describe a market to someone because then it's not actionable. So I thought about that a little bit, and I spent a day in Wrigleyville, right near Wrigley Field, and went to about 37, 40 accounts, went up and down the street, found out that that wholesaler was only calling on five of those 35, 35 37 accounts. So I went back and I described that to and had a meeting to them. And way Jim described it afterwards, he goes, that was perfect, Robert, because again, if you think about what's a market, you actually described the market because of 35 accounts because they could kind of now imagine what do I what do I do to make things possible and change things because if you just talk about a, a market that's not actionable and you gave them an action and then that snowballed into each part of all of Chicago land and how we were be able to work better with this wholesaler over time. So do you have a uh, do you know the number of different roles or titles that you've had within the company leading up to your role now as head of innovation? Yeah, it's probably like seven or eight or nine, something along those lines. I think the beauty of that, it, that, that doesn't really matter because we're actually not much of a title company. Mm. Um, it, it's more about what you contribute to the whole than it is to what your title and yourself is. Um, but what has really worked out for me and why I've stayed for so many years is finding out what the company needs are and then how my strengths then fit to what those needs are to make myself happy and to make the company as prosperous as possible for the future. So, you know, that doesn't happen very often in companies and it is truly one of the true reasons why I've stayed for over 34 years because we've taken advantage of my skills and I've taken advantage of Boston Beer Company to, to take those skills and put them in the right places. Do you think to be successful in your role, you need to have that kind of varied experience within the same company in order to really understand it and really get it? Or is it something that can truly just be learned elsewhere and applied to different organizations or companies? I think it's a bunch of different things. What makes us unique and, and me a little bit unique inside of what I do is connecting dots. And I think also the uh, the ability to make um, ideas happen, but not that are partly mine, but also partly research. It's interesting to work with some, uh, we've partnered with some other bigger companies. And when we're with those bigger companies, when they make decisions about how they're gonna move forward on new products, they use a lot of research. And almost all their research then goes back to what are they going to have as an end product. and But we like to look at things as both having science and music at the same time inside of it. There should be some part that you use to do research, and but it shouldn't be 100% research because then that's anybody can do that. And we can put an accountant inside an innovation role. But if you're thinking about inside of true innovation, it's using research to help guide you, but also using your gut and your knowledge that you see across of visiting accounts, seeing the world and keeping your eyes open and then taking those dots of research and your gut slash music that you kind of have in your brain and coming up with an idea and moving forward with it. And that leads nicely into my next question for you because here at BU, when I do get a chance to talk to our students or our recent graduates, innovation comes up all the time. I think our students um, are are very much wanting to be part of that, right? Like revolutionizing something, have a, having a tremendous impact on an organization or a product. Um, I, I know that you're aware there are all these institutions now at the university, the 
uh, Engineering Product Innovation Center, the Build Lab, um, all of the support for people who have ideas who want to make things happen. What you just said a lot of it, but are, are, what are the key pieces of advice that you think a, a young person, a student, or a recent grad would really need to know about um, one day having a role like yours? Well, I, I again, it, it's if you're lucky enough to be in an organization th that lets you be free to take what you see in the world and bring it into whatever you're working on. And I th think that it's an opportunity for others to think about everything them around them and then how can they make it better. And, you know, a great instance is I'm also involved with an XBU student um, in a company called Cleanup. And um, they have revolutionized uh, toilet seats. Toilet and seats. Kevin, <laughs> I saw that. And, yeah. and Kevin and his team, um, you know, just to think about that someone thought about a toilet seat who was 21, 22 years old and had a better idea than Kohler, who every day Kohler, the company Kohler, who is one of the largest toilet seat companies in the world or American Standard. They look at toilet seats every single day. And somehow this 21-year-old, very intelligent, very wonderful human being came up with an idea and actually then acted on the idea, funded the idea, and made it actually work. And I think it's finding an interesting insight that isn't there, that there hasn't been done before that makes you different. And those will come from many different places. Um, but I can tell you one thing, they're not going to come just from looking at a computer and looking at trends, um, because everyone's looking at that same material. That should be a guide to you and help you, but you got to try to do something that's going to be different and successful. You can't just look at the same thing that everybody else is looking at. You have to look at, at the entire world, interact with the world, talk to human beings, um, about what they're doing, and maybe not even in the same formal uh, as a quote-unquote focus group, but in real world, go out to whatever you're working on and be part of that world and see what people are doing and talk to people. Um, because that's what's going to give you probably your best ideas is knowing what humans really want and then interacting them directly with them. I was thinking about how... It, it seems to me, I've, and I've been at BU for nearly my entire, it's like almost half of my life. Um, and you've been at, at Boston Beer Company for 34 years. And it, I was thinking about how people stay fresh and keep uh, their work exciting at the same organization. And I know that you are very often asked to come back to campus and speak to classes. Um, and in just this year, I, I think it was this year, you were invited to speak at the... Um, Shah Leadership Summit, where you did a talk about being an entrepreneur instead of an entrepreneur. How have you applied that idea in in staying at the same company for so long? Well, I think what what's nice about it is two things. Is one, I, as I've spoken about before, um, we have an amazing leadership team with Dave Berwick and Jim Cook that see that innovation is where our company is going to grow and give myself and others the latitude to be able to come up with ideas. Uh, as an entrepreneur, the, also the part that's nice to it is that you can, um, you're well-funded. And, and so you, you don't have to, you know, completely um, know that be nervous every single day about where the funds are going to come from and where things are. So if you're as lucky as I am in a company that I have am with is I have the freedom to think about new ideas to grow the company for the future, but also have the funding to help work on those ideas and not have the stress deep down in my gut every day about raising money and how that is. I am involved in some of the things outside of work of some startups of different companies that I've been involved in. Um, and most of the time, um, they're wonderful ideas, but a lot of the stress you go through is about raising money. So it takes that element out and you can really then concentrate on what you're trying to accomplish. You have, in your time at Boston Beer Company, introduced or worked on some, and this is an intentional pun, some truly 
uh, iconic brands for the company. When you look back, what are what are the the projects or the things that you've done at Boston Beer that you're just the most proud of in your 34 years? I think probably the most proud is Angry Orchard um, because it was something that I saw that that there was a that was an opportunity inside of the United States and it fit extremely well inside of Boston Beer Company for what we were doing. And what I saw was there was an insight that there was two types of ciders in the United States. There was kind of the old, stale, boring uh, Europeans like Strongbow um, out there. And then on the other side, you had Woodchuck, which was uh, a nice Vermont cider. But I was also kind of thinking, you know, what does a woodchuck have anything to do with cider? Like, why are we putting a rodent on a package? So I thought if I could kind of take the quality of what they are doing in European ciders and the kind of funness that was going on in woodchuck, but make it so it really blends into what cider is about, which is the orchard. Um, and I was lucky to spend a bunch of time in England um, learning from some really amazing cider makers um, and I was able also to hire one of the best cider makers in the world to help us start Angry Orchard and, and came up with one, an iconic brand um, inside of a Angry Orchard and the packaging that we did and the look and the feel. And then um, work with, um, for us, it's all about the plant. Um, it started with Jim and what his great, great grandfather did with Sam Adams was using um, German hops and then using um, the highest quality barley that was available to make Sam Adams, um, or at the time, his, uh, his grandfather's Lewis Cook Lager's recipe that turned into Sam Adams' Boston Lager. Um, and we did that same thing. We use French apples, and the French bittersweets are the best type of bittersweets in the world. And then we were using Italian culinary apples which are the best culinary apples. And it's the mix of, of that bitterness of the bittersweet apples and the sweetness of the culinary apples, bringing those together um, in this glorious way of making an a, extremely great cider. Um, on top of that, I was also the founding member of the American Cider Association. And we were able to change and bring laws into effect to help small cideries uh, be able to grow in America and also put some boundaries around this high quality beverage that most Americans really don't still at this point, unfortunately know about that you can do with cider and age them. And we do it. We built this uh, Angry Orchard cider, cider in upstate New York, and we do it there and barrel some amazing ciders. But it's that, that what we did is changed to make cider what cider should be, which is made from apples and from pears. And if it's made from other things than that, then actually the tax goes higher and you're penalized. If you want to try to kind of abuse what cider is, it's going to cost you and you're going to have to pay higher federal taxes. So we put that law into effect um, and, and work with the U.S. government and has started the Cider Act. Um, so to me, growing the cider category um, in the United States and getting people to understand about um, something that's new and different, uh, but also comes with such long heritage and amazing men and women over the years developing and making this unique quality beverage inside of alcoholic cider. Yeah. We're running up against our time, but I do want to uh, leave our listeners with, I'm curious to know what's next for Boston beer. Are there things that you're working on now that you can share with us, but also What's next for you? Do you see yourself finishing out your career at Boston Beer? I know you've, you've been involved with Kleena, as you mentioned. Are there other things that you're working on that you're excited about? Yeah. Um, well, one of the others is uh, I've been working with a uh, two professors um, here in Boston on a ski company that we're close to hopefully um, selling the IP to uh, oh. of changing the flex of a ski by 25%. Um, using an app on your phone and, and a material that we have a patent for. And that's been, uh, skiing is one of my passions and to be able to hopefully give people uh, a better way to be able to ski because skiing hasn't changed in over 30 years. Um, and that change was to parabolic skis. Mm -hmm. um, and there really hasn't been a change. So 
trying to find, I think for me, yes, I would love to stay at Boston Beer Company. I get excited and love going to work every day and taking, quite frankly, a pretty small company and going up against some of the biggest companies in the world um, day in and day out and figuring out how to out, out shine them in some of our ideas um, and what we're doing. So I see myself trying to find other ideas like what we do with inside of our ski company or what Kevin did with a toilet seat um, or myself um, in, in looking at new categories. And I think what I love about this was what I, again, what I did with cider is there's some wonderful old stories about wonderful beverages and categories that people don't know about. And I'd like to be able to kind of express the best ways that you can make these products and, and share the information with people about these different types of uh, beverage that are available out there. And that was one of the reasons I went on the trip just to Mexico City to help do that. Robert, it was really great to hear this story. And uh, I, I appreciate you making time in your day to chat with us. And, and hopefully with you being local, uh, maybe someday soon, I can I can buy you an adult beverage and, uh, That'd be great. and thank you. Well, but Let me do it. I, ha I haven't bought a, I haven't paid for a beer in 34 years. So Let's not stop that now. Uh, this, one will, this one will still be on me, but thanks again All right. and cheers. Thanks again to Robert for joining me. I know I have enjoyed more than a few of his innovations over the years. It was fascinating to learn how he has spent his entire career searching for unique answers to interesting questions. If you heard something today that makes you proud to be you, I hope you'll join me in donating to the BU cause that means the most to you at bu.edu slash give. Thanks for listening to Proud to Be You. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your episodes. The Proud to Be You podcast is produced by Boston University and our partners, Five Tool Productions, a BU alumni-owned, Boston-based company specializing in video production, live streaming, and content marketing. Our theme from artist.io is Think About Lights by Ben Fox. All additional media in this episode has been shared by our guest. To learn more about Proud to Be You, visit bu.edu slash proud to be you.